The Lord be with you. Thank you. Welcome to the, the uh, brave and hearty souls who are here this morning joining us for Living Way in this uh, snowy morning. Uh, let us begin with our opening song, uh, song number 575, um, My Hope is Built. All other ground is sinking snow. That's what it's like this morning. Thank you, Jan uh, Pat. Thank you, Pat, for filling in this morning. Um, yes, you know, the, the roads were okay. Uh, but it's funny how, like, you go out, you, coming in, you get, like, on Old Olympic, there's, like, packed ice snow kind of stuff. And then you get to Fifth Avenue, and it's, like, mud. And it's, like, they must have a lot of de-icer they put out in the city of Swim here and there. But not cedar. It's kind of packed snow. Anyways, but glad you all safely made it here, even from Texas Valley. My goodness, wow, you guys, uh, glad you drove down, down the mountain this morning. So, uh, But we understand entirely, you know, our policy is if there's no school, we cancel Living Way. That's kind of our go-to. Um, if it's a late start, we start on time because it, we are a late start. This is about the time school's starting right about now. Um, but always, we defer to your judgment. We want you to be safe, and if you don't feel comfortable driving, and I'm speaking this also to those who are watching on the video this morning or later on this week, it's always at your discretion, we understand, and that's why we do the video too, so you can later, um, the only thing you miss is the small groups. You don't get a chance to meet with our brothers and sisters in that way. Just a, a reminder, those of you who were not here last night for the Ash Wednesday service and those online, that we have uh, Advent, Advent, Lenten devotions, <laughs> available they we got them kind of late they came on monday so we're kind of making certain everybody is aware of them there's some on the table out there some on the counter i'll try to remember to remind you as we leave today um, i think they might also when they're handing out the lecture lessons have them available if you want to pick one up when you're coming in for the lecture that would be great too so these are for the the the, uh, the season of, of lent as we head toward easter let's pray 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Regardless of, of wind, rain, snow, whatever the weather brings, Lord, we know that you are here and you are with us. And we thank you for the, the presence of your word in our lives, the living word, Jesus, and the written word, the, the Holy Bible. We thank you for the opportunity to share the word, Jesus, and your word, the Bible, today um, in our small groups. As we share with each other, may we be strengthened in our faith and in our fellowship as brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask this in the name and for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Amen. See you back at 11 for the lecture. I think we're still missing one group, it looks like. We're, we're having a little snow delay here, I think. <laughs> but it looks like, looks like we're missing a group. I'll just go ahead and start. Before I pray, I'll just mention a couple little things here. Just uh, um, a reminder about the, the devotional book. So I'll try to remind you on the way out so you, that would be on your mind if you want to grab one. Um, also, I have, you know, I'd like to have, I always have a, a Bible text. I also print up some of the texts here in larger print just to make it easier. It's kind of dark up here. But I enjoy, you know, the red letter Bible. Uh, I, when I grew up, I never had red letter Bibles ever. It just was the regular, and that's fine. And normally I use a normal, just a non-red letter Bible, but it's just fun to look at the text in a red letter Bible, just, just glancing at the chapters, because anything that Jesus doesn't say is in black, okay? And that means when someone else talks, it's in black. And when something is, a description is given, it's in black. But when he speaks, it's in red. And so when you look at this, it clearly shows because when you look at it all in black, it's like, who's talking? Who's saying? What's this? What's the guy? What's the question? But when you look at it, it just jumps out at you so clearly. Like, oh, the Pharisees are doing this. And now the disciples say this. And then and it just it, it helps you kind of picture how it all fits together. And it's, it's a helpful thing. Okay, let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this day and for this opportunity to once again focus upon your word from the Gospel of Luke. We thank you for Luke. And for leading him, Lord, to write this beautiful gospel. And we thank you that we can share um, these many centuries later um, in this time of, of learning and growth through your holy word. We ask you to bless it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So chapter 17, verses 11 to 19, to begin, Jesus heals 10 lepers. This is the gospel reading every Thanksgiving. So if you come here on our Thanksgiving Eve service, uh, this will be the gospel reading, the healing of the ten lepers. Uh, Luke's the only one that records this. Jesus healed lepers elsewhere, including in Luke earlier, he healed a leper. Uh, but this is the only record of the healing of the ten lepers and what happens. He's on his way to Jerusalem 
So things are starting to pick up. In fact, in two chapters, they're going to be there. It's going to be Palm Sunday in chapter 19. So that's coming just very, very quickly. Um, <clears throat> they travel along the border with Samaria and Galilee. And, um, and so that's why there's this mixture of the Samaritan with some, with some Jews. Uh, and there he finds 10 men who had leprosy. Uh, they stood at a distance. Okay, that was what was required. Uh, because of the relationship, they had to be away from other people, trying to not uh, transmit disease, you know, kind of, it was a, a, a government shutdown, you could say, in a way, you know, on, on these people with leprosy. Um, so they stood at a distance. And as you look at the story, we can take it on the surface and think it's a, it's a story about the healing uh, done miraculously by the Savior, the Son of God, and it is. But it also reminds us of our distance to God, from God, in our sin. You know, we are like lepers to God in our sin. When we're without Jesus, we're like lepers. Like, we can't even come close to God. We're at a distance from God. And Jesus did something about that. He does it for this guy, because at the end, this guy's going to come, and he's going to cling, to, you know, throw himself at Jesus' feet, that close. And Jesus allows that to happen because he heals him. And just as Jesus allows us to come to him in his grace by his, his work on the cross for us, he heals us, you could say. Um, so as they went, they were cleansed. Uh, Jesus didn't have to touch them. He could. He has. Many times he does that. He's not afraid of touching a leper. Um, he doesn't have to be physically present. He just says what to do, and it's done. It happens. Kind of like in, in the creation story. You know, God speaks, let there be light, and there's light. And God speaks here, go show yourselves to the priests. And they go, and as they're going, hey, we're healed. Jesus just says, and it happens. Um, so then they go, um, but one of them, one of them, uh, seeing he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice, making a big scene. And who wouldn't? You know, you've been a leper, you've been, had to live out on your own and, you know, separated out from everybody else. You can't just have a normal life. And he's healed. It's like, wow. Um, and by the, by the way, go show yourselves to the priests. That was, the priests were the ones that were responsible for, they're the ones that put down the guidelines of, you are a leper, you got to be um, isolated. Or if you're healed or whatever the disease that you have, if you're healed of the disease, okay, now you can be made clean with sacrifice and so forth, and now you can be restored to the community. Um, so there, that's why they were to go to the priests. Um, imagine, though, this, was, this, this goes back to a, another uh, t teacher I remember one time, and I think I've, ta I've taught this before, probably on Thanksgiving when we've done this gospel. But you know the story about the Maytag repairman, the old commercials? They called him the loneliest man in town because, you know, the Maytag never broke down. So um, this, imagine the priest, you know, in the temple whose job is to check lepers who have been healed. You know, he's the loneliest priest in town because it wasn't happening. And all of a sudden, all these whole bunch of guys show up at his door. Hey, you know, check us out. We've been healed. And so that, that's kind of the, it, it would have astounded that priest. Like, what? What's happening? Who did this? Well, this guy named Jesus. And it's like, what? Okay, um, where was I? See, these are those things that just pop in my mind, and then I throw them out there as freebies, but then I get lost. Now, where was I in this outline? Um, <clears throat> okay, so there, the only one, though, comes back and thanks him. He threw himself at Jesus' feet, and Luke makes certain to point out. And he was a Samaritan, like of all people. You know, the Samaritan dogs is what they would be called by the Jews. Um, they're hated by Jews, but the gospel breaks all barriers. You know, rich, poor, uh, color barrier, um, male, female, all of it is, is, you know, there's no, none of this, this is better than that and all that type of stuff. Um, and then Jesus says, he asked the question, Where's, where are the rest? You know, where are they? Um, was no one found to return and give praise or thanks to God except this foreigner? And, and it, when I think about it, you know, we, we kind of, we bottle up 
Thanksgiving as a day. And rightfully, I mean, I think Thanksgiving is wonderful that we have a national holiday. And, and the point of it is to stop and give thanks. And hopefully people think about who do you give thanks to? Well, oh, we'll give thanks to each other. Well, that's fine. But, but God is the one that brings real blessing. And so um, we have so much to be thankful for. Just everything. The fact that you're here this morning. Thank God for that. I mean, we don't, we don't think about how much we are unthankful. We just receive and we receive and we receive. And we have so much to be thankful for. Just all beyond, beyond, um, beyond I can't even stop thinking about how much we could be thankful for. Um, <clears throat> and then Jesus said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now, don't think that, oh, he's healed because of his faith. No, Jesus healed him. Faith is a gift. Faith is a gift. Ephesians 2, it is by grace you are saved through faith. And this is the gift of God, not, your, not of works, lest no one should boast. Don't think that his faith is somehow a work that he then, because of his faith, it made him well. No, it's a gift of God. Um, and, and you could say, in a sense, to, he's saying to this leper, because the other lepers were healed too. Where's their faith? But he says to this leper, you know, your faith has made you well. And that's deeper than just, well, you have no more leprosy. You are well in your soul, in your spirit. You know, you are one, you are right with God, you know, because, uh, because of Jesus there. And he's, he's receiving Jesus, you know, as his Lord in that sense. And, and that's us too. It's more than just being healed of a disease. We all have health issues. Some of us sometimes we're healed, sometimes we're not. But it's more than just being healed in that way. There's a wholeness that we are made well in faith in Christ. We are well. We are certainly well in Christ. Uh, verses uh, 20 through 37, then we go on. Um, uh, there's some questions about the coming of the kingdom of God. And it's interesting because at the beginning, the Pharisees ask, when this is one of those places where I can see the black and then there's a bunch of red and then at the end there's another black and there's a where the disciples asked Jesus so when is this going to happen where is this going to happen and Jesus kind of says you know those aren't the important things um, so the question of the Pharisees were when the kingdom of God would come and that's a question people still ask you know when is God's kingdom coming and um and Jesus says, it's not something like it's over here or over there. Um, he says the kingdom of God is, in the NIV, it's translated within you. I don't think that's a, uh, the best translation, and I'll tell you why. Because he's talking to the Pharisees, okay? Um, was the kingdom of God within them? Not really at this point. Those who were against Christ, and, and, and there, could, there were some believers like Nicodemus, you know, who was a Pharisee and who was just honestly searching for the Messiah. Um, but but the, I, I would say a more clear translation would be, which the NIV does, or ESV, the English Standard Version does, is among you or in your midst. In other words, it's here. Jesus brought the kingdom of God. You know, he is the son of man. And he comes and he's there and it's in your midst. It's within, it's among you right now. The kingdom is here. Um, and that's true today as well, because he brought the kingdom of God to earth in himself. We're living in the kingdom of God right now in the church, the body of Christ. And then he's coming back for the eternal kingdom to complete everything on the judgment day. And that it's all covered here. He says, it's among you right now. Here I am. Um, and then he says, it's also going to be coming in fulfillment at the end time, the final end. So, um, <clears throat> People go around and say, is it there? Is it here? Is it there? And you know, like, is the kingdom coming? And there's been many false messiahs who said they're going to come and they're going to come back or they're going to, they have arrived. And he says, don't believe that. Um, <clears throat> first, he must suffer and things be, many things and be rejected. He's talking about, for him, it's the cross. He's a suffering messiah. He's going to suffer. But there will also be suffering in the church. He's, he explains elsewhere <clears throat> later on in Luke and also in Matthew about, um, about the church through the ages being persecuted and suffering until the time of the, the final judgment. Um, and then he gives an example of, of um, 
the, the world and then the coming of the Son of Man, as it was in the days of Noah. That's the context. Or as it is in the time of Lot, the Sodom and Gomorrah. And people are living their lives, and they're eating and drinking, doing their work, and they're just living their lives without God, is, the, is what's happening. And, and then suddenly God breaks in with the flood, or God breaks in with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, or God breaks in with the coming of the Son of Man. Now, that'll be the final break-in, or not say break-in, but that's the final kind of surprise will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, <clears throat> they, then Jesus goes on to talk about how you'll have two people, and they're just living their lives, but this person has faith in Christ as a, as a child of God, and this person is not. And you got two people side by side, and when Jesus comes back, this one's going to be with Jesus in the eternal kingdom, and this one's going to go to hell. That's what the fact is. That's what, that's what he's saying here. You had the people living in the days of Noah. Here's Noah and his family walking with God. Here's, this, here's all the rest of the people living their lives, doing all this, and then God breaks in, and the flood comes and takes them away to judgment. And Noah, God saves in the ark. Uh, Lot and his family living in, in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. God, um, here, they're living their lives, and here's all this around them that was so evil and just rotten, and they're just living day by day, and then suddenly, whoosh, Lot's taken away. God sends angels to take him out of the city and his family, and then the rest, um, poof, they're taken away to judgment. That's what Jesus is talking about. Now, some people have used this to, to talk about a rapture where Christians will disappear from the world and then everybody else will be left behind on earth to live for a long time until the, until the final judgment comes. It's not what Jesus is saying here. He's saying he's going to come back, and when he does, that's going to be the judgment right then. And two people, although even in their own family or in their own um, friends and the same whatever, that they're going to, because of Christ, uh, you know, or because of faith or no faith, they're going to be judged at that moment, and some will be taken in judgment, like with the flood, like with Sodom and Gomorrah. And so it will be at the final day when the Son of Man comes, and the others will be safe and taken by, by Jesus. Um, uh, let's see. Just a, a summary here of six things that Jesus says, basically. Six things about the coming, the future coming of the Son of Man. And I have to say this is important because most of the major cults, modern cults in America, all of the American made ones, are based on preachers who are proclaiming the coming of Christ and giving dates and times and places, you know, um, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, all these different, different groups that have sprung up, American-made religions, all began with charismatic uh, preachers who would say, uh, Christ is coming, and I, I know when, and you got to get ready, and you got to follow me so you can get ready. And then, of course, it didn't quite happen out like uh, they're all dead, all those guys who were saying Christ was coming. They even, one of, the, one of the groups, I won't go into it, but one of the groups even says, well, he came but invisibly, you know. And so he had, he had some invisible work to do, and he's coming back in the future. But, he, but first of all, there are six things that Jesus said about his future coming of the Son of Man. Number one, that day won't come as soon as they may wish. Number two, that that day will be known to all and not happen in secret. So when he comes, everybody will know it. Like Matthew and elsewhere, he talks about with the trumpet sound, the, the angels will you know, proclaim it. The sky will be full of angels. Um, so everybody will know. It's not some secret, not some little hidden thing. Uh, number three, there must be a time first of suffering. Number four, that day will catch many people unprepared. That's a big point of what he's talking about here, people not being prepared. And number five, the end will be in a moment. It's like, it's done. You're not getting a second chance. It's not like, well, he's come kind of partially, but he's going to come the rest in after seven times seven years, and then we're going to do another this and then that and this and that. No, when it comes, it's the end. When he comes, it's the end. Um, and sadly, family and friends will be separated by the final judgment because it's not based upon your friendships or your family, but upon Christ. Faith in Christ is the only thing that saves. So an application, the when and the where of the coming of the Son of Man is not something that we need concern ourselves with. The right question is not where or when, but are you ready for his coming? And the only way to be ready is to have faith in Christ. That's the only way. 
faith in Christ. That's the only way to be ready. That's why Jesus later asked the question, when the Son of Man comes, will there be faith on earth? You know, what's the important thing? Faith in Christ. Okay, chapter 18, the parable of the persistent widow. Um, he told the story about how they should, and this is, this is nice because Luke explains what the purpose of the parable is. You don't have to try to figure it out. What is this parable about? What's it mean? He says he gave this parable so that they should always pray and not give up. That's the point of the parable. Hey, you should pray and don't give up. I like that. Makes it easy for the teacher. Um, so in a certain town, there's a judge who was this kind of a rotten character, you know. He's like, he, he just doesn't care about people, what they have, with their feelings. I mean, maybe he's, I don't know. But he's called an unjust judge. In other words, he's not just a nice guy. He's just this judge that's just kind of like, leave me alone. I don't want to deal with you and all this kind of stuff. So, um, so what happens, though, this woman, um, she's coming to the judge asking for justice. And, and he kept refusing to hear her case and just didn't want anything to do with it. Come on, leave me alone. Um, but she keeps persistently, persistently coming back to him again and again. And then finally he gives in. And he says, you know, because I, it's not because I care about her. I don't care about God. I don't care about her. I don't care about anything. But because she keeps bugging me, she keeps bothering me, you know, then I will give in. Because, because of her persistence is what it's all about. Literally in the Greek is that she keeps giving me a black eye. It's kind of funny. In other words, like, it's like this jab, jab, jab. Like he's punching at him. Like he's literally punching him's face he's just like she keeps punching me so much i just can't take any more fine i'll get justice for her so jesus then says well this is an unjust judge this this guy who's kind of a rotten guy and because of her persistence he gives in well think about god who loves you you know who cares about you who saves you you know he he wants to hear you pray. He wants to, to answer you. Of course, when we pray, we know it's not our will, but God's will that counts because our will, we're still tainted by sin on this side of heaven. And sometimes things we ask for maybe are not the best things in the, in the, in the long run. Um, but just again, he says, but do be persistent. Don't give up. Come to God in prayer. And, and that's important because it, it's our relationship with God that we can have at any time and place. It's not like you have to come into this room or this building to have a relationship with God. You can speak with the Lord anywhere, anytime, any place. And especially when you're driving home today and if the road's starting to be a little slippery, Lord, please help me. Be with me as I drive home, you know, Lord. Um, and God wants to hear our prayer. Um, and that's where then he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? Reinforcing that same application of, of be ready, have faith. Be connected with the Lord. Um, an application here, if an unjust judge, I already kind of said this, will finally act as a result of persistent prayer, how much more will God take action for his own people that he loves? We're encouraged to keep praying in the midst of our sufferings. Don't give up. God will see in the end that justice is done. Okay, and finally then, the end of the, this uh, section that we're studying today is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And Jesus told this to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. And maybe this is, these are the kind of the points when the, 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 the Pharisees often get a little bit irate with Jesus. Because he, he, he doesn't, he doesn't, he just, let me tell you a story about a Pharisee, you know, and, and, a, and a tax collector. And here's all these Pharisees, you know, that are around listening. And, of course, they're going to take it personally. And you know what? They should. We should all take the words of Jesus personally. When he speaks, we need to listen. There's another commercial. Isn't it E.F. Hutton, whatever? When E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens or something. I, I don't know. I grew up in the 60s. Those were the commercials back then. I don't, I don't watch TV anymore with the commercials. I don't know the modern ones. I have to ask Pastor Roger what the modern commercials are. But, like, um, when Jesus speaks, they all listen, but... He's saying things so people could take it to heart. That's the point. That's the reason the law is spoken at times. This, this has law in it. You know, you can see, and it should condemn the heart. If you're standing as a Pharisee doing what the Pharisees are doing, it should speak to your heart. You should feel like, yes, 
But instead, we can also, though, get defensive and try to justify ourselves. And that's the point here. It's like they're, they're confident that they're good enough for God and everybody else, they're not good enough for God. Uh, and as we know, no one's good enough for God. You know, we all have the leprosy of sin. So to some who were confident of their own righteousness, he told the parable. Um, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood up and prayed. And then what he prays basically um, isn't really much of a prayer. It's more of a bragging about himself. <laughs> you know, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. That's a prayer. It's like bragging about how righteous he is, how Oh, what a great guy he is. How oh, God must really be pleased with him because he's super great. Um, but then the tax collector, note the words carefully. The tax collector stood at a distance. Do you recall the first story we, to we talked about today with Jesus and the lepers? What about the lepers? What did they do? They stood at a distance. It's, it's not just happenstance that this is here. You know, there's, a, there's a meaning here. And again, it, it speaks deeper than just leprosy or deeper than tax collector. It's talking about our relationship with God. We're at a distance without Christ. So um, this tax collector, he is at a distance from, yes, God. And, and we are too without Christ. But what does he do? He looks up to heaven, beats his breath, and says... God have mercy on me, a sinner. Which is actually part of our liturgy of one of our divine services. Divine service four, when the pastor's up front and he says how, why are we here today? That we are all sinful. Um, only by God's grace and mercy can we be forgiven. And how we then call out to God, God have mercy on me, a sinner. We're quoting the tax collector from the parable in worship. In fact, that's, by the way, that's what liturgy is. The liturgy is basically, it's all scripture. We're just saying the words of God in the, in the worship service. So, um, and that should be, that is our prayer. That should be our prayer. It is our prayer. God be merciful, have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, and, and by the way, that was, that was uh, what the lepers asked Jesus. The NIV translated it, pity, have pity on us. But really it's talking about have mercy on us. That's it. that's it. They're saying the lepers and this poor tax collector, both are saying the same thing. You know, Lord, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And, and, and God does have mercy. Um, so the application here is the Pharisee boasted of, of how much God needed him. In striking contrast, the tax collector confessed how he needed God. Our righteousness comes not because we are less sinful than others, but through confession of our sin and faith in God's mercy, God's mercy, which is ours in Christ. Let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy, the mercy that we know um, brought Jesus to a cross. Um, we thank you for the mercy of forgiving our sins in Christ. We thank you for including us through baptism into your holy family. And we thank you for the eternal life to come when the Son of Man returns, that's gonna be the kingdom of heaven forever. Lord, in the, mean, in the meantime, as we, as a church, as we live, may we be truthful to your word, may we be loving in our actions, and may we share Jesus with a world that, that needs him desperately. And Lord, as we walk through our Lenten journey, as we head toward Easter, we pray that you'd be with us as we realize, um, along with the lepers, along with the tax collector, our need for your mercy always. Thank you for the mercy you do have for us in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Remember, there's devotional booklets if you haven't got one already in the narthex, a couple places.